net zero emissions uh, commitments, which have been enshrined in, in the law. Um, so for um, the UK, New Zealand and France, it's by 2050. For Scotland, it's by 2045. Um, and I'd like to single out the, the UK uh, a little bit, just to add a bit of pressure to Mike, because the UK is also in this special year uh, having the specific role of, of um, having the, the presidency for the the international conferences, the COP26 that will be held next year, uh, where all countries are, are expected to, to come with an advanced plan. Um, now, in addition to this commitment and expectation to enhance our existing commitments, um, the four countries that are represented today are also among the ones that have started to take initiatives uh, on how to put social justice at the heart of uh, climate action, or at least are, are starting to think about how to do that better. Um, among the climate action agenda, there's been a growing importance of what we call the issue of just transition, um, which is basically about how to make sure that in achieving uh, the climate transition, we leave no one behind, and in particular, those sectors that might be adversely affected by uh, a shift to a low carbon economy. Uh, this was really given prominence uh, by a country that held previously the presidency of international negotiations, Poland, um, and the topic of coal regions in transition uh, in Poland was given particular emphasis. Uh, but just to maybe state as an introduction that the, this issue of social justice is much broader than just this topic of coal, um, and also that there are other challenges to, to, to social justice that go above and beyond the issue of climate action, including digitalization or addressing social inequalities at large. Of course, the recent COVID crisis um, has put this nexus at the forefront of the international agenda. Um, and now that many countries are trying to tackle how to uh, support their economy uh, in a in a in a way that doesn't infringe on the, the the you know their climate commitments, they're trying the difficult balancing act of uh, saving the economy while also um, trying to not um, while also trying to save the climate. At least that's the challenge that many countries are faced with. How do we recover better? In the words of the UN Secretary General. Um, so there's a renewed momentum and relevance to these questions, and I'm really happy that we're going to have these four uh, complementary perspectives on how specific countries have started thinking about those issues. Uh, I'd like to first give the floor to Lucy Gagan, who leads the team, uh, a new team in the Scottish government that is developing a Green New Deal. And um, also in line with our topic today, this team is also leading on Scotland Just Transition Policy. Lucy, over to you. Hello, and uh, good morning, or good afternoon uh, for France, in France. Um, so as, uh, as introduced, my name is Lucy, and I am the head of our Transition Policy Unit in the Climate Change Division in the Scottish Government. Um, and I'm here just to talk to you briefly today about the approach Scotland is taking to the Just Transition, uh, a little bit more about the Just Transition Commission that was mentioned in the intro there and some of their emerging findings. And I think mostly focusing on how the Just Transition is feeding into and shaping Scotland's recovery from COVID-19 and driving towards a green and, and equitable, fair recovery. Um, so just some background so everyone uh, knows the context that we're working in in Scotland. Um, so last year, Scotland was one of the first countries, first developed countries to declare a global climate emergency. And then subsequently, we updated our climate change legislation to set some very ambitious targets, as we've just heard, a net zero target of all greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. Uh, but also interim targets, so a 75% reduction by 2030, so very challenging time frame. We also have annual targets. Within the climate change legislation, we also updated um, uh, to commit to delivering um, a just transition. 
at the heart of our legislation. So as we said, we've enshrined this in law and also a climate change citizens assembly in Scotland, uh, as well as further um, provisions for sustainable development and, and climate justice. So in Scotland, what this means in practice is that we're looking at ensuring that the transition to net zero is one that is um, fair and equitable for everyone. And it recognizes that there are gonna be opportunities in this transition to net zero for economic growth and innovation and, and social cohesion and, and, and opportunities for, for social justice, but that these opportunities need to be available and accessible to everyone. And that we also need to recognize that there are risks in this transition. So we need to make sure that we're planning on how we're gonna manage those risks. And in particular, learning lessons from the past transitions, which maybe we didn't plan Plan as well as we needed to and how we can avoid some of those those challenges that we see um, it means that we've embedded just transition principles into the heart of some of our key emerging policies so we've also established a Scottish National Investment Bank which will is due to start lending um, or investing this year and uh, at the heart of that bank is a, a mission-led approach and the primary mission of the bank is for a just transition to net zero so how do we bring in private investment behind this, um, this huge challenge of this transition and as we say capture some of the opportunities. Um, the just transition approach in Scotland is also very aligned with and part of our broader approach to a well-being economy uh, which colleagues from New Zealand will no doubt also talk about as we talk about um, as we are members of the founding members of the well-being economy governments um, and it really looks at how we bring together this systematic understanding of the well-being of Scotland's citizens, uh, economy and natural environment can all enable and sustain growth, sustainable growth, uh, and that the right kind of growth can support the well-being of future generations. So our just transition is very much part of that approach. And it's also delivered through Scotland's national performance framework, which sets out clear outcomes um, or, that we're aiming for uh, in terms of sustainable, inclusive growth and well-being, uh, as well as um, as well as our well commitment to the well-being economy governments. So we to develop this, obviously, this is a very big conceptual um, uh, priority for the Scottish Government, but we recognise that uh, it needs to be embedded into practical action and, uh, and really driven forward uh, as quickly as possible to make sure that we are planning and preparing for this transition. So in 2018, we committed to establishing an independent just transition commission, and that commission started its work in January 2019, it has a two-year mandate, so it's due to publish its final recommendations early next year. It's chaired by Professor Jim Ski from Imperial College London, and is also involved in the UN IPCC, and 11 members who are drawn from academia, unions, uh, businesses, and environmental NGOs to give that diversity of voices. They have been engaging widely right across Scotland, holding evidence sessions, inviting different views. They just closed their open call for evidence. Um, and that has enabled them to uh, prepare an interim report, which they published in February. And the report emphasised kind of three emerging conclusions. Um, the first of which it seems self-explanatory but or self-evident, but is, is worth reflecting on, which is the need for plans uh, and it sounds simple but this this point that we can't assume that we can cap that the opportunities that we talk about will be captured automatically and that the risks that we're aware of will be managed effectively unless we work together in this partnership approach to plan for the future and this re their emphasis is very much on participatory planning not just between governments and businesses but also with the communities who will be affected and ensuring that everyone has a part to play in that planning. 
obviously that's challenging. So we've asked them to come back with further advice for Scottish ministers about how we can do that effectively. So I think it's an interesting finding. The second of their findings is it builds on that is is the idea that this needs ongoing engagement with the various parties affected by the net zero transition. And this means inclusive participatory approaches that aren't just quick consultations that end, but are rather kind of ongoing um, ways of engaging people in setting the future direction of their economic growth and social cohesion, etc. Uh, and then the third recommendation they have is, is also a challenging one in some ways, which is around how we embed equity at the heart of policymaking. And this speaks a lot to things like impact assessments that we do on policy and how we really test and evaluate the impacts that policy decisions will have, particularly maybe on those more vulnerable groups. Now, this is obviously really important as we're looking at our green recovery and how we're assessing the policies that we're trying to deliver as quickly as we can um, to make sure that we understand the real imp the, the holistic impacts of them. And then finally, they set out some immediate uh, areas to focus on, which includes the COP26 as referred to. This is a key theme for Scotland going into COP26, but also the climate emergency. We have a climate emergency skills action plan in development. So looking very much at labor markets and skills and how we can support workers in the transition. And we're also updating our, our Scot Scotland's climate change plan, which sets out over the next decade how we're going to meet our very challenging emission reduction targets but how can we make sure that we're doing that in a way that is fair and equitable so finally uh, before I pass on um, how are we thinking about this in terms of Scotland's recovery from COVID-19 um, I think it's it's fair to say Scotland like other countries has focused on on this primarily as a health crisis but obviously increasingly as an emerging economic crisis and and the challenges around growing unemployment and inequality that have been um, uh, exacerbated often um, through through this crisis. So as we look at how we're going to deal with the health crisis, we're also looking at what is going to be possible in the future. What kind of Scotland could emerge from this crisis through the recovery? Uh, as our First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has said, the uh, our long term goals in terms of a net zero, a just transition to net zero have not changed. Um, but we need to build now towards a fairer, greener, more equal Scotland coming out of COVID-19. So there's a, there's a recognition in Scotland that our recovery needs to not just deliver economic stimulus or reduced emissions, but instead increase our resilience as a society and provide support from those who have been most affected by the pandemic. Um, and this is also echoed in our advice from the Committee on Climate Change, who we'll hear from in a little bit. And, you know, the imperative of a just transition is that government designs policies in a way that ensures the benefits of climate change action are shared, but also that the costs do not fall on those least able to pay or whose livelihoods are most at risk as the economy shifts. So that has really helped us to kind of embed the just transition approach at the heart of our thinking around the economic recovery. And just finally, um, so and I should say that we have asked the Just Transition Commission to give us further specific advice on how to consider the just element of the green recovery. And they're busily preparing a report, which they are due to send to us at the end of July. And um, and I think just just three kind of takeaway points, I suppose, from a Scottish perspective before we hear from from our other uh, steam panelists from other countries. So one which won't surprise anyone is obviously the impact on oil and gas, not just from the pandemic and the fall in demand, but also the global fall in oil and gas prices. And what does this mean in terms of the transition planning that was already starting amongst oil and gas stakeholders within Scotland, um, particularly as regards to unemployment within in the sector. It's a huge employer in Scotland. There's a huge regional impact in the northeast of Scotland, but also more widely through supply chains and downstream businesses. So this is a massive challenge for us. It's something that will be the focus of the of the Just Transition Commission's engagement with the sector. In fact, they met with them this morning to hear in particular from, from workers within the sector about 
about some of the challenges and what it means to think about a just transition in practice uh, and what is available to them. Um, the Scottish Government has recognised this and has already announced £62 million of additional funding through an energy transition fund as part of the immediate response to COVID. And this is really focused on key areas of growth for the net zero transition, including projects around hydrogen innovation, carbon capture use, usage and storage, uh, as well as um, kind of supporting the wider uh, uh, business engagement uh, and inward investment in, in that area. Um, we're also looking obviously at the impacts on vulnerable consumers and fuel poverty and what COVID means in terms of exacerbating some of those inequalities. Scotland has a particular challenge here around a number of fuel poor, poor consumers who are off our main grid in more rural areas and really considering how policy responses are taking those, um, those into consideration as well. And then finally, and not, and, and not just for Scotland, the challenges around behaviour change. I think there's some really fascinating insights coming through around, you know, these this this fundamental shift we've seen in behaviours. How sustainable is it? Its longevity, um, particularly for us around the use of public transport and what that means from a just transition perspective. If if indeed people don't go back to buses, many of our kind of lower income people rely on buses as their primary transportation so so what would that mean in the longer term and how do we design public transport policy in order to support 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 people um, so those are just a few of the Scottish specific reflections uh, I'm happy to pick up on any questions but I'll leave it there thank you thank you very much for this very extensive presentation um, and also for delving a bit deeper into the uh, the question of the the carbon intensive sectors which is a uh, a very a very topical question right now, and the the challenge in the oil and gas uh, in Scotland is, um, you know, obviously something to to be addressed um, with a lot of uh, sensitivity. Um, I hope we come back to it in the in the Q and A. Um, I'm going to turn next to another country, which, as you mentioned, um, has put the well-being economy at the centre of its broader policy making approach. Um, uh, Roger Duggan is the Deputy Ambassador of New Zealand uh, delegation to the OECD. Um, and I think we'd all love to hear more about this well-being economy approach, uh, and in particular what New Zealand is doing in terms of having a just transition uh, to advance uh, progress towards net zero economy. Thank you very much. Over to you. Is Roger still? Alice, is there a way to unmute Roger Dungan by any chance, or is he having issues? I think he's having technical issues at the moment oh, because he's okay. unmuted. Okay, all right. Then in that case, maybe it's better to um, shuffle the order of uh, of speaking for a panelist and give maybe Roger a couple more minutes to hopefully get back online. Um, so I'm going to move next to Sébastien Treyer, uh, who's chief executive of IDRI and my boss, uh, <laughs> the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. Um, Sébastien has also been part of the expert group in support of France's uh, Citizen Convention on Climate Change. Um, and I think it'd be very interesting to contrast uh, the discussion, the state of discussions in France which sectors have been uh, particularly a focus of this issue of just transition with regards to climate action, and maybe in particular how the Citizen Convention has made some proposals uh, in that respect. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you very much, Lola, and thanks to the uh, uh, organizers of the Scottish Government. And, and it's really uh, very interesting for us uh, playing uh, not only in Paris, but uh, with the French players of hearing how. Uh, things are taken in Scotland and New Zealand, and I'll come back to that in my conclusion. The first thing I want to do is tell a little bit about the French context and how the, this issue of social justice appears in the French debate on, on the getting to net zero. Then uh, talk about the Citizens' Convention and, and I have a few uh, takeaway messages. So what I think is important uh, uh, for France, uh, yesterday the uh, French High Council for Climate issued its uh, 2020 report, which explains that France 
the France's uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions are still too low, uh, and so we are not on track. Um, I think to explain that, we need to take into account that what is quite specific to France is that the energy supply side is already quite decarbonized uh, because of the very high share of nuclear energy in power production. Uh, so if we want to decarbonize further in France, that puts already a lot of emphasis on efforts to be done on the energy demand side, uh, on mobility and transport, on energy efficiency in buildings, for instance. So this has put quite early uh, an emphasis on issues of social justice on the consumption side, on the user's side, uh, quite uh, in contrast with the focus on jobs in coal dependent regions that has been focusing all the attention, particularly around the Polish presidency of the COP uh, uh, in Katowice. So the, the Yellow Vest movement in France was to some extent an expression of this major issue of social justice when facing inevitable uh, actions towards transition and, and taken from the side of citizens, users, consumers, inhabitants who say, I can't change. How do you want me to change? And that, that, that I think is very important. Uh, it's, it's about jobs, but it's also about the, the, the consumer side. Uh, I want to stress uh, another big part of the, of the next efforts to be made in France, which is in the agri-food sector. Uh, and the French players in this sector are already aware of this. And at the same time, they are quite reluctant uh, to be the first ones in Europe that would be compelled to move forward, probably with the Irish. But, but they, they, the French sector is voicing very hardly that they don't want to be the only ones compelled to go to net zero if the others don't. Uh, that raises, I, I want to stress a little bit the agri-food sector, but it raises, because it raises issues of social justice uh, in terms of, of course, access to safe, nutritious, sustainable food for consumers, uh, but also uh, it's very important in terms of jobs. For the jobs part, um, it's about not just primary producers and farmers, but also about an important proportion of jobs for France that are in the SMEs and industries of, of processing, of food processing. In terms of share of the agri-food jobs in the overall amount of jobs, it's, it's probably less than 10%. But it's very important jobs because these are the jobs that have resisted to the delocalization, to the deindustrialization of France. Particularly, in, this is vital for many of the more rural regions in France, and I, and I think particularly of Brittany, for instance. So what I want to stress this, but already the other speakers have, have put the emphasis on that, our issues of social justice in France are not just about just transition for fossil energy depending regions, but it's generally much more a, a question of complete, completely uh, restructuring uh, uh, major functions in our society, jobs and industries, consumption patterns and lifestyles, food, mobility, housing. So this is really one of the reasons why, and I come to my second point, this is one of the reasons why I think it was a smart move by the French government to propose a citizens convention on climate. Uh, it was smart, but I think it's also important to say that this proposal was really initially pushed and, and really they had the meetings with President Macron to convince him by NGOs and experts of participation who believe that actually the main problem that we're facing is actually a very profound crisis of democracy uh, that are underneath the question of how, how can we actually pilot or steer a just transition. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to understand that we do not have only an economic crisis and its social consequences, we also have a profound crisis of our democratic processes. You should just have a look at the very low levels of participation in the municipal elections in France. This is really striking. Normally, you could think, and particularly during the crisis, mayors were the only ones in, in, in uh, the politicians in one in which uh, uh, the, the citizens were still having trust. Nevertheless, they didn't go and vote for the second round of elections. Uh, very, very few of them, very few of us, actually went to vote. So this is this is worrying to me. Uh, this democratic crisis, and this is why we need to look. The social justice issue, both in terms of the equity and vulnerability, but also in terms of democracy. Um, what, what, what do I retain from the citizens' convention? Um, so, so there were 150 citizens with the model of the of the Irish uh, citizens' assembly. I think that was the model that that, that uh, the, the designers had in mind. They have expressed the citizens in France have expressed very strong messages. The first one, which is not an, which is not obvious is that they say, yes, we need to move towards ambitious efforts in climate. And they even added, we need also to move on biodiversity, because if we degrade the ecosystems, we will degrade our carbon uh, balance. So we need to take biodiversity and, and, and climate jointly. And this was not a given. Initially, that is that the citizens were not supposed to be agreeing so much with that mandate. And they say, yes, this needs to be done. And the second message is that if we want to be consistent with these objectives, we need to, to trigger structural changes in all these fields, 
food industry, consumption, housing, mobility. And they have identified a very exhaustive and relevant set of measures in this regard that are completely systemic. They said, if we want to change, we need to unlock our transition in a variety of fields. Uh, and I want to, to, to retain some elements that I think are particularly important in, terms, in times when we, when we are designing the, the recovery plans. They say first, yes, we have a shovel ready program for public money to be invested in favor of the transition. And that would deliver core benefits in terms of jobs, equality of access to services and climate and biodiversity. Uh, and so that program exists and that needs to directly feed the recovery plans. Second point, they say also, yes, we have a program that can be funded, but money is not sufficient uh, to trigger transition. And there are a set of other changes that are necessary, the way that you can organize the channels for individual access to subsidies in terms of energy efficiency of, of, of housing, norms and standards need to be changed, also setting up new markets and value chains, for instance, for farmers, if they need to transition to vegetal proteins. So this is just to say money matters, but we need also a whole policy program to, to accompany that. The third point that is not very often uh, looked at in the French media is that they, the media were saying they, uh, the citizens didn't say no, anything about the, the carbon tax. And I don't, I don't believe that this is true. It's true that they didn't want to, uh, re, to, 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 um, to take the responsibility that, of President Macron and say, yes, we are going to go for a carbon tax. But they have a message. And, and the message that I interpret is that the fiscal instruments are, of course, important signals to reorientate the economy. But they can be very problematic in terms of social justice if everything is not in place for individuals to find an alternative and to have a choice. And that's, they have said that in various instances in their report. And I think that's very important, um, particularly in times where we have so many vulnerable people, as, as Lucy has been already saying in the case of Scotland. Um, and, and, and the last point I want to say is that they have been talking a lot, a lot also about the speed of change and the capacity to change. So they, in the French media, you hear a lot that they, that they were fascinated by forbidding and, and regulation. I think what they said is very smart again. I mean, citizens are smart. I think that's really one of the, of the key lessons. And for French people, it's always good to, to, to remind us of that. Because, so so what, I, what I was trying to say is that they, the citizens have insisted a lot on giving clear signals uh, of future changes through regulation, that things, some of the things are going to be forbidden, pesticides are going to be phased out, we are going to, to change the norms. But this needs to be prepared, uh, and we need to, to, to prepare with policies and, 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 and public funding programs the possibility for individuals to change. This needs to be accompanied, and that takes time. And I think this matter of time has been very, very rightly pointed out by, by the Convention. So I want to conclude by just saying, what are my takeaway messages from that for two things, recovery plans and the issue of just transition? On, on recovery plans and the Green Deal, I, I think we are very, very happy at Idri that our leaders in the European Union have really heard that the long-term objectives of the Green Deal need to be the crucial, crucial horizon of our reconstruction. And I think it's also clearly stated um, uh, even by major economic players in Europe. And that's, that, that I think is a good sign because we have a common vision, a common aspiration towards the Green Deal. Um, and I think for the, the recovery plans, there are lots of opportunities to target sectors in the recovery plans that will deliver triple wins on jobs, on more equal access to services like mobility or high quality food and environmental transitions, these three core benefits. Um, money is key and the money that will be made available with the recovery plans needs to be directed prioritarily towards the, these green and job intensive sectors. But it's not only about money, it's a whole policy package if we want to take care of justice, both on the production side for jobs and on the consumption side for users and consumers. And I think I just want to react on what, on what Lucy was saying. To some extent, even before the crisis, there was an issue of uh, the Green Deal being a, a horizon for reconversion of the whole industries and the whole economy of the continent because of other economic viability issues. I mean, you can talk about oil and gas markets, which is not only due to the to the, to the COVID crisis. And so now I think from reconversion, we are, we are going to talk about reconstruction, but we need to be aware that reconversion is a story that we have told in the uh, steel producing regions in Lorraine, in Saarland, in, in Germany, etc. With lots of things that we did not do well. We have a, a report at Idri on, on coal transitions where we try to get the lessons that are quite similar to the Just Transition Commission's report of the three points that Lucy just mentioned. And I think we need to think also 
That was Paul Magnetz, the, the, the Walloon, the former prime minister, who was saying the issue of getting out of coal has been an issue of uh, a history of uh, more than a century. We still are dealing with the political consequences of that. And I think that leads, that, that it really interconnects the issues of democratic processes, justice, and transition. So we need to think also of, of the political impacts of what we are doing. So on social justice, my main message is that just transition is, is an issue not just for some of our regions that are specialized in a specific industry like fossil energy. It's like the Green Deal. It's a project of sustainable and equitable development for all our countries, for all our, all our territories. What is at stake is the possibility for our regions and countries to have a green and just plan for reconstruction, a new project for, for their territories. Uh, and, and, and this needs to be built with a lot of emphasis on democratic and participatory processes, with lessons from the citizens' assemblies, like the French one, the Scottish one, the Irish one, and the ones to come in Britain, in Spain, and maybe in Germany. Um, it's, I, and, and the last one, or the last thing I want to, to stress is that it's very important to have here in the panel both Scotland and New Zealand, territories and countries that have decided to put well-being at, or happiness at the heart of their vision of, for the future, putting thus the critical indicators of GDP and employment only as the means for an end, rather than the ultimate objective that we need to pursue. Uh, this, this very particular moment of reconstruction, I think is a real opportunity to work actively on solving the crisis of democracy. Uh, if, and that may be possible only if both the process and the content of the recovery plans are designed in order to answer the citizens' concern for their well-being and for the ecological crisis. Over to you, Lola. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Um, I already sent some um, uh, synergies between, between your two presentations, that emphasizing that it's not just about money, but also that we need plans and that we have some leads on, on how what these plans could look like. Um, and also, in addition to being at the con interconnection of low carbon transition and issues of social justice, there's also an overarching theme around uh, participation at large or democratic issues, which which can't be um, forgotten. Um, I'm going to try to give the floor to Roger Dungan from uh, New Zealand. Roger, over to you. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ngā mihi ki a koutou katoa, ki te atua, tēnā koe. Ki a papa tu anu ku, tēnā koe. Ki te whare, tēnā koe. Ki te hunga mate, ki te hunga ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks very much for your kind introduction. Um, I started off with a few words of greeting in te reo Māori, which is the language of um, Indigenous New Zealand. Um, that's really important because for us in New Zealand, the approach to a just transition uh, has as one of its foundations um, a partnership between government and Māori, who are the Indigenous people of um, Aotearoa New Zealand. Thanks very much for the chance to be part of this um, webinar. It's pretty clear. Um, I think, Lola, as you've already said, there's a lot of synergy and a commonality between um, what uh, what people are saying. The technical glitch meant, unfortunately, I met, missed quite a bit of what Sebastian was saying. But certainly I could was listening to what Lucy's uh, comments were and I could just, you could replace Scotland with New Zealand and a lot of that and you'd have exactly the same um, uh, picture. So it's a really important opportunity and very useful to exchange views. I know my colleagues back home um, in Wellington are really interested in this. Um, because it's the middle of the night for them, they're all asleep, I hope. And they might be calling in, I'm not sure, but um, they've asked me to say a few words um, on their behalf. Um, and in doing that, I really want to acknowledge their policy leadership um, on this. Um, so I'll do my best to answer any questions that um, people might have. Um, but the tricky ones I might have to send um, back home to them. They've also done the thing which um, is always a little awkward in that they've given me some prepared notes which I'll, I'll, I'll read from, so it won't feel quite as interactive um, as perhaps some of the others, but it's important to get the messages right. So if it means that I read off a script, then uh, forgive me um, for doing that. So look, in New Zealand, the Just Transition Programme um, is really, as others have said, about defining what the transition to a low emissions future looks like for us. Um, and what steps we need to take towards a sustainable, productive, inclusive economy with good, high-paying jobs, which really supports uh, well-being of, for all New Zealanders. And it's easy stuff to say, but really hard um, to do. Um, it's really a partnership between central and local government, between Māori, business, workers and unions, and communities, firstly, 
um, to better understand how the transition uh, might impact on different communities um, and to help us make choices about how we manage those impacts um, in a just and inclusive way. Um, it's really about building an understanding of the potential pathways to transform our economy uh, and really take full advantage of the transition um, to a low carbon future. It's about identifying, creating, um, and I guess supporting new opportunities, new jobs, skills, uh, investments that will um, emerge um, from that transition as well. So my colleagues back home who are leading this work are in our Ministry for Business, Innovation um, and Employment, and the, their Just Transition program really has two um, sort of focus areas. And the first one uh, is on partnerships, and it really aims to advise our policymakers and teams, uh, give them the skills that they have uh, to take and support a just transition approach. Um, again, easy to say, hard to do, um, but it's been applied for us in a, in a regional partnership in Taranaki, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment, um, to assist them uh, to plan the transition of their people and communities um, to a low carbon future. And the second key area of focus uh, for them is, um, is really their work to support coherent and aligned policy, and that involves um, good advice to develop and maintain um, a really good just transition framework and system, um, coordinating advice into key climate change policy processes, again, drawing on that well-being uh, approach to help that. A really important for us is developing an evidence base to better understand the distributional impacts of major climate change policy decisions on people and communities. Um, really important to acknowledge that uh, the transition doesn't affect everyone equally. Um, key to get a good handle on that. And finally, working with our economic development systems to ensure um, that that just transition lens, if you like, uh, is used in the development of policy um, and operational work. So how does that all work in practice? Um, practical example uh, is really a, the approach that we've taken uh, to the Taranaki region, which is in the North Island of New Zealand. And just by way of background, it's New Zealand's uh, biggest oil and gas producing region um, with both offshore platforms and onshore operations. Um, so back in 2018, uh, the government, as part of its um, you know, low carbon transition approach, decided uh, to stop issuing new permits for offshore oil and gas exploration and onshore exploration outside of the Taranaki region. Um, and so that quite clearly cuts off a future pipeline of economic development uh, for the region and for New Zealand as a whole. Um, but it crucially doesn't affect existing exploration permit, permits um, or the ability to extract resources from um, uh, existing fines. So, I mean, you can imagine that that had quite a big um, impact on the Taranaki region. I mean, it's, it's a really important part of its economic foundation and future. Um, and so the government really initiated an intensive partnership with the communities there to help them plan their transition towards a, a low carbon future. Um, it's got two key elements. The first one was they hosted a, um, a national just transition summit um, and it helped to build an understanding of just what exactly it is that we mean when we say just transitions and how that can be applied in New Zealand and how we can get support for it. And that was pretty well attended. We got, I think, more than 500 people from across central and local government, Maori tribal leaders, uh, business workers, um, broader community, especially youth, and was also attended by um, our Prime Minister and key Cabinet Ministers, as well as some global just transitions thought leaders. I and mean, importantly, it was held in the Taranaki region, which so really helped to um, demonstrate the government's commitment to that regional partnership. So for us in New Zealand, um, it was a pretty big deal. <clears throat> if you're interested to find out more about it, um, it's, there's a really good summit website. Um, it's got all the presentations, all the background information. It's easy to find. If you just Google New Zealand Just Transition Summit, uh, it's the first link that pops up. Um, and it's got video links to all the presentations. Um, I was looking at a few this morning, and they give you a really good picture um, of the issues that are front and center uh, in our thinking. And if you do nothing else, then have a look at our Prime Minister's uh, keynote framing introduction, uh, because that puts a very regionally focused Just Transition program um, into a broader political context um, for New Zealand. That gives you a sense of the flavor um, of how that's working. So the second core part of this has really been establishing this framework to support the region's uh, economic development through to 2050, 
um, as it transitions to a future that's less dependent on the development of fossil fuel resource. I mean, as others have said, I mean, the, the focus really is a collaborative multi-stakeholder partnership to establish that shared vision um, and to identify the pathways that the communities themselves wanted to focus on. And that identified 12 transition pathways, and they included um, eight focus sectors, uh, not surprisingly energy, um, food and fibre, broadly speaking, our primary um, sector. I mean, Taranaki is a really, um, it's an important farming region. Uh, dairy, for example, is a key part of that as well. Uh, tourism, it's a beautiful place. Come visit when you can. Once we you know, lift our border restrictions, you'll be able to come and see just how wonderful uh, Taranaki is. I say that because that's where my family's from. Um, the fourth one was the Maori economy, uh, infrastructure and transport. Um, Taranaki is a part of New Zealand that you have to divert to, to go to. It's off kind of the beaten track a little bit. So for them and their communities, transport and infrastructure, super important. Health and well-being, I guess, is an approach that undergirds a lot of what the government does. Environmental science and the art sector, so eight focus sectors. And then four cross-cutting um, areas or enablers, so people and talent, making sure that we're supporting people and what they do. Innovation and research and development. I mean, making this transition isn't going to happen by itself. We need smart people doing smart things. We need to support them with innovation and good science and tech. Regulation, we've got to get the regulatory settings right to allow this to happen. Um, and metrics and evaluation, as I said at the start, understanding how this actually works in practice, what are the impacts of policy interventions, super important. So the team back in Wellington have been doing some strategic planning uh, to develop those 12 pathways, um, which is nearing completion. And the next step is to really put that into action. Now, while I myself haven't been involved directly in this, um, my colleagues are telling me that they've learned some really important lessons already from this key roadmap, from this roadmap um, process. And the first one is that responsibilities um, need to be really clearly defined to avoid confusion. Now, again, that's one of those things that easier said than done, especially uh, when you're learning by doing. Um, I don't know how they went about that, but I can imagine in a really collaborative uh, situ uh, process when you really want to hear what people are saying and empower them uh, to speak and make sure their voice is heard, that can create some tension around who's doing what and, and why and when. So it's important to try and get as much clarity around that as you can. Uh, the second one is that local leadership and engagement is absolutely important. You can't just come and impose this on a community. You've got to listen to them and work alongside them. Um, you know, again, I haven't been closely involved, but from what I know of the people who are who are doing this, um, they may be a little bit hard on themselves. I know they, they'll be doing that, that well. And, and the approach that we have with working with Māori communities, the indigenous people, um, that gives us a framework that helps us with that a bit. Um, another one is really supporting a process led um, by this multi-stakeholder partnership. It really does require, especially for central government, a different set of skills and approaches. Um, you know, you can't just say to people, go and consult effectively with the community if they don't know what they're doing. It's actually, I know from my own experience, it's, it's pretty tricky to do, especially when tensions are high potentially, as, you know, as, as central government decisions are impacting on communities in, in particular ways, or in the context, especially for New Zealand, where you've got to be, um, you can't have a genuine partnership with Indigenous communities without understanding as we call it, the tikanga Māori, their way of doing things. Um, it's really important. So that um, partnerships focus that I talked about at the start to make sure policymakers have the right tools, super important. Um, it's also really uh, clear, and I think this, this picks up a little bit from um, what Lucy was saying, that uh, central government has a really important role in strategic planning. Um, as a coach, advisor, and broker, you know, it, it's, you've got to have a, a clear vision for what you want and, you know, those of us representing governments here are a bit lucky in that our governments have some very clearly articulated targets which have a lot of um, uh, political buy-in, super important. Um, and as I keep saying, you know, for New Zealand, the, the, the relationship that the government has with Māori, absolutely fundamental. We can't do this uh, in a way that doesn't recognise that um, and embrace that uh, collaboration and partnership in a very genuine way. Uh, finally, transition initiatives, super time and resource intensive. Um, you can't make it happen overnight. 
um, it takes a while. And in an environment where political pressures are high often, um, and the Prime Minister talks about this in her speech on the, um, the Just Transitions uh, Summit website, you know, political decisions are often taken on election cycles. You know, for us, that's three years. Um, and doing something as important as in a very effective Just Transition will take a bit longer than that. Um, so you've got to make sure you allow uh, time for that to happen. So where does that leave us? I mean, the active support for Taranaki uh, is starting to wrap up now. We've kind of got the planning and, and it's about ready to hand back to the community. Um, so the Just Transitions team is learning from that to develop its policy frameworks. Um, they're using their experiences to, to build the expertise and tools that they have and can apply to other situations um, and really increasing capacity and capability to work with other parts of government. Really important. You've got to have a cross-government approach to this. So they're really interested to, to learn from uh, other people and especially the other panellists and the approach that their governments are taking. Um, and they're really open to collaboration and sharing experience. I mean, they said to me, make sure you find out how we can collaborate and how we get in touch with everyone. So I think that's easy to fix. We just swap emails. Um, but they're really, you know, that we're all learning, right? None of us have a perfect answer to how to do this, but it's pretty clear from the presentations that we've had that people are really committed to it. We want to make it work, you know, to, to do the kind of fundamental change that our economies really need to achieve the transition to a low carbon future. Um, it's hard, it's difficult. Um, we can't do it all ourselves. We've got to work together. So if we can share experiences and ideas, um, yeah, we're all for that. It'd be great. So again, thanks very much. Really useful conversation. Um, looking forward to a bit of Q&A. As I said at the start, I won't have all the answers to those. Um, so forgive me if I have to send some of that back to Wellington, but we'll try and follow up as we can. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was extremely interesting, very complimentary as well to have this uh, detailed description of how you're going on about it in a, a specific region of Taranaki, um, as opposed to the more kind of national approaches that we've heard about so far. Um, I'm going to turn to my last panelist, just also reminding everyone to please ask questions in the chat uh, so we can pick up on them quickly later. Um, so, Mike, um, please tell us about how the UK has uh, approached these topic. Uh, clearly, the UK has a lot of eyes on itself um, in terms of climate action. Again, no pressure, uh, <laughs> but also has a rich history around transition, um, which hasn't maybe gone so smooth in the past. So also a lot of interest in, in you know, how to drive this forward um, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leila, and thank, thank you to all the other panellists as well. That are fantastic and fascinating things to listen to. Uh, I've, been, I've been scribbling and lots, lots of really interesting stuff so far. I'll, I'll try not to repeat it, but, but to add to it. Um, I think the first thing is that we're at an inflection point at the moment. The coronavirus has been a, a horrendous, a terrible pandemic, but it has also kind of, it's created a bit of a window and, and a bit of an opportunity at perhaps exactly the time when we, when we need it as a world. Because as you said, Lola, we've got at the end of next year now, it was due to be in, in November this year, but now November next year, we have got a, a crucial next round of climate talks, the, the successor to the, to the Paris Agreement in effect. Uh, that will be in Glasgow uh, in, in November of next year. And, and the world has got to get much, much closer to being on track at that point. We're, we're way off at the moment uh, and we need to get on track at, at that point. And we'll only get on track if the recoveries that are being planned in, uh, in cabinets around the world at the moment are, are green recoveries. Um, so we have this kind of, we have this absolute need to, to shift our economies onto a, a net zero, a, a, a low carbon pathway. But we also have at the moment, we have this kind of moment where everybody has been affected and everyone in society across the world has has had a chance to stop and, and to think. And and I think we're not just seeing that, that climate prerogative to do things differently. We are hearing a, a call from publics to do things differently. You know, we've seen that certainly in the UK in poll after poll. Uh, we've seen it in the, the initial report from our climate, our citizens assembly uh, on climate change. People don't want to go back to the normal that we had before. They want to go back to something better. So that it's not just the UN Secretary General calling to build back better. It is it is society at large, I think. So we're we're in this moment to to do things things differently. Um, 
we also have the context that the pandemic has affected people incredibly differently across society, um, both the direct health impacts, but also the, the economic impacts are, are, are hugely different across different parts of society, different groups. Um, we know that climate change will affect people very unequally, both across the world, but also within within every country. Um, and we are about and we are putting ourselves onto this transition that brings with it opportunities, but also brings with it risks and, uh, and challenges. And, and we have to make sure that that transition is making things better, not, not making things worse, clearly, because we have enough external challenges <laughs> without making things worse by the things that we're, we're choosing to do. So I'd, I'm really glad that you're setting up this discussion. And, and again, thank you to everyone else, because I, I, I'm learning lots already. Um, I thought what I might usefully do would just be to unpick some of the, the elements of just transition and I, I can talk about how we've we've assessed them at, at CCC and, and what the government in the UK is doing. Um, I should explain, first of all, that the, the Climate Committee is the, it's an independent statutory advisor in, in the UK. So we uh, are not part of the government, but we advise the government both on their climate policy. So we said that they should have uh, have the net zero target. Uh, that, that incidentally, we, we set just a day before France uh, and about a year before New Zealand. Um, and we advise on how they can get there and whether they're on track to it. But we don't set the actual policies ourselves. Um, and when we advise that it, it should be done, we, we said that the, the first thing to appreciate is this is a massive endeavour. This is a huge thing that we are trying to do. This is a transformation, um, a transformation in our energy production, in our energy use in our behaviours, in the things that, that we all as, as a public are, are doing, uh, and also in our land, in, in how we use our land uh, and how, how we farm on it. Um, so that, that kind of, that massive change can be lost a bit sometimes when you break it down and you look at the individual bits. But I think that is the point really of the just transition is to, to know that look, this huge transformation is happening and we have to make sure that all the bits of it work for all the, all the areas that are affected. And I thought I would just go through the, the economics, um, the consumer angle, so uh, the users, particularly of energy in, in the UK being a key point, workers, um, uh, and then people. So the economics is broadly that the overall net effect of shifting to a low carbon economy is probably not that large, actually. There might be a very small overall cost, there might be a very small overall benefit. But that net effect masks that there are huge absolute things happening. We're, we'll be spending a lot less on some things, particularly imports of fossil fuels, and we'll be spending a lot more on other things, particularly investment um, in, in renewable energy, in electric vehicles, uh, in, in heating systems in our homes, et cetera. Um, and, and the point is, if you have those huge changes, that's when you bring in the risk of, uh, of, of problems of transition and, uh, and distributional effects. And so the interesting thing about the cost is not what's the overall impact on GDP, but what is it meaning in terms of the distribution, uh, in terms of the, the transition. Um, if, if we turn to, to consumers, and that's been, to be honest, historically, that's been the real focus in the UK is what does this mean for the end consumer? How is it hitting, hitting people's pockets? That partly reflects the journey we've been through and, and where we are in our transition. Um, but I think it also partly reflects the way that we've tended to think about things, the kind of political norms in, in the UK. Um, and again, there are, there are opportunities and there are challenges there. Um, real opportunities as we shift to electric transport, this can be cheaper for people. We, we're going to get to the point when an electric car is cheaper to buy than the conventional car that it replaces. And it will, of course, be much cheaper to run because it is inherently a much more efficient thing. Uh, it uses its its fuel much more efficiently, and it can it can benefit from the very cheap renewables that we're starting to now see uh, uh, coming in. And also on the renewables, you know, they're not just cheaper, but they're confidently cheaper. They're not going to go up and down in price year to year as we've seen fossil fuels do uh, historically, and that's been a major source of uh, of macroeconomic instability in the UK. So that shift is a is a real opportunity, but there are risks in terms of in the near term, particularly increased energy costs. Uh, and that, that bears a particular problem for households. Uh, Lucy mentioned about the, the high fuel poverty we have. That's uh, people who, who can't afford to heat their homes properly and meet all their other uh, expenses. Uh, we have issues in terms of industrial competitiveness. So we have high energy bills already in the UK. And that is a challenge for industry 
And clearly, if we bump up those bills more and we push our industry out and it pops up somewhere else, that's bad for the economy. It's bad for people and it's also bad for the climate. It doesn't deal with the problem. So, uh, so we, need to, we need to address that, that side uh, in terms of the impact on consumers. Um, what we're doing there is that the Treasury, uh, the UK Treasury, is doing a review of all the costs of net zero. It's reviewing where we can get the funding from and how we can allocate uh, and bring in that funding in a, in a fair way in a, and in a way that we protect the vulnerable groups uh, that otherwise uh, we, we would have a, have a problem with. Um, if I move on then to, to workers, and I guess workers is, is, is the headline grabber, isn't it, of the just transition. That's the one that a lot of us think of first of all. And as I say, I don't think we've, we've gone as far as we might on that in the UK. And I think that is a rich ground for us to do better. Again, there are, there are absolutely opportunities and challenges. Um, there will be just as many jobs in the low carbon economy as there have been in the high carbon economy, but there will be different jobs. That will be people within some industries doing different things. So maybe they're producing electric cars instead of producing conventional cars, but it will also be different industries. There will have to be some transition some jobs we will not need anymore. We will not need to be taking oil and gas out of the North Sea as much. We will not need to be refining that into petrol and diesel. But we might need to be burying CO2 under the North Sea. We might need to be refining biofuels. We might need to be um, doing other things that are, are outside of that space. So the challenge is to move, move people, move workers into the jobs of the future rather than the ones of the past. Um, the oil and gas one is, a, is definitely a, a big one in the UK, but finance as well is, is one that, that we don't particularly think of, but we will need our financiers, clearly a big part of the UK economy, uh, to do things very differently. Uh, and I think that's worth recognising work that's been done by the Bank of England. Um, Mark Carney has been a real champion of this, of this transition. Um, and by the Green Finance Institute that we've set up in the UK, we have a green finance strategy. We have an institute to, to help us with this. Um, and I think that's something that I hope will ripple beyond just the UK. That's clearly a, a, an international industry. Um, and yesterday, the Chancellor in the UK announced, uh, as part of his first bit of stimulus package, he announced a, a, a huge new funding programme for energy efficiency in homes uh, and in, uh, in public buildings, and very much doing that as a job-creating tool. So it will, of course, help us to meet our climate targets, but it is being done as a key part of the package um, the plan for jobs, as the Treasury called it, uh, is now uh, got a, a key green feature in it. And it's probably worth just reflecting that um, this is a competitive game now, actually. You know, this, the, the green recovery is not, it's not about you know, moral high ground or doing things right. This, we are engaged internationally in a competitive game to secure some of these future industries, to secure a low carbon hydrogen industry, to, to, to secure the future of automotive and battery production. Um, tomorrow we'll be trying to secure green steel and green cement. And you know, this is the direction that we're going in now because the world has agreed that, that we're heading this way. Uh, and so where we need to be is, is ahead of it, not, not behind it. Um, I, right, I'm, constantly, I'm taking too long probably. Let, let me go on to people and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll bring, bring it to a close. Um, we don't have a, a well-being um, as a strategic goal in the UK. We haven't said, right, we're going to stop tracking GDP and we'll, we'll, we'll track well-being. But of course, the, the job of government is to <laughs> protect well-being and to make people's lives better. Um, so we, we're very cognizant, I think, of, of, again, real opportunities here, cleaner air, cleaner streets, quieter streets. Um, again, things that have really been apparent to people in lockdown. Uh, that people are really appreciating their local green spaces much more. They're appreciating being able to go out and use their streets and cycle and uh, and walk because there have been less cars uh, on the road. Um, and and there are risks though as well. So we there are lots of things we can do that make people's lives better, but there are also risks. If we insulate houses and we don't think at the same time about ventilation, about overheating, uh, indoor air quality, then then we can make things worse at the same time. If we plant trees everywhere, and I know this is a, a big concern in New Zealand, if we just carpet the place in lots of monoculture forests, then we've missed out on a chance to, to uh, give people loads of ecosystem services to improve biodiversity. 
So we've got to make sure that we're, uh, when we're planting more forests, and we do need to plant more trees, we're doing it in a way that we also are helping the environment, not, uh, not creating environmental damage. So the key things I think in the UK we've got at the moment, we have our own Citizens Climate Assembly, which has completed, but has, has not yet reported. It should report in a, in a couple of months or so. Uh, we have an environment bill, crucially, which is going to replace the European Common Agricultural Policy uh, for the UK. And that is putting at its heart public goods. It's putting at its heart protecting the environment, um, using our land to provide uh, good quality, by the, to protect biodiversity, to provide ecosystem services, and to help to adapt and, and to uh, mitigate climate change. Uh, we have a transport plan, which is under development, which puts demand at the start, that begins with helping people to cycle, to, um, to walk, to make public transport the, the first choice, and only then comes onto, uh, onto electric cars and, and the like. Uh, and what we don't have yet, but we certainly are pushing strongly for in the Climate Committee, is uh, a, a set of local area energy plans where we bring in local people and we have a, a real conversation. We really engage people at a local level to work out what people want their, their future use of energy to look like, uh, where they would make trade-offs and how they want to do those things. Um, we don't have that yet, but I think that will be a, a crucial piece of the puzzle. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. I'll just conclude by saying that we, we absolutely, we can recover, we can cut emissions and we can make lives better. But as everyone else has said, we've got to plan for it. We've got to put the right policies in and we can't wait. We've got to do that now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, very, very inspiring um, and also very exhaustive in terms of the different facets of the, the just transition. Which, you know, I started off by talking about the, the coal miners in Poland, which kind of grabbed uh, everyone's attention. But that's very right to also put it more broadly uh, in, in perspective. Um, we have about 20 minutes left um, to answer some Q&A. Um, I suggest to maybe ask a couple of questions and let um, panelists react. Um, maybe one um, which is, uh, about the role of uh, maybe on the, on the back of the, the Taranaki uh, experience, um, how do you uh, address the, the regions with high proportion of heavy industry or oil and gas, uh, which may be more vulnerable to the effects of the transition? So going back to kind of a, the traditional understanding of, of just transition, um, going back to what specific actions uh, are taken with regards to those regions, uh, in addition to the, the broad participatory processes and uh, setting aside some, some funding for, for reskilling. Um, I wonder how, you know, how do you see the, the key elements of addressing the future of those regions um, being? Because we've, we've covered a few different challenges sectorally uh, across your four countries. Um, and maybe just a, another precision asked by um, uh, an attendee of what are the key elements of, uh, of just in just transition? What, how should that be understood? Um, I think parts of it is also in the various uh, elements of your answer, uh, Mike, um, but I'd be happy to hear more from, uh, from panelists on this. Maybe Lucy, because at the end of, um, uh, sorry, Roger, were you starting to, to speak? I think I'm still on mute. I don't okay. know I am. No, no, good. I was getting ready to answer, but if Lucy, by all means, you jump in first. No, 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 you go first. I'll, I'll come in after. Okay, just it was mostly just because um, Ola mentioned the, the Taranaki experience. And I mean, you know, how do we address that really regional focus, especially where uh, regions have industries which are, I guess, transitioning out, it's really hard, eh? Like, you know, you've got people who, um, and, and again, you know, Taranaki is a good example because, and, and this is where the, the engagement with Māori communities is so important. You've got people who, they don't want to shift. It's, this, that's their home, right? So, so for them, it's about creating opportunities where they are. Um, and that's one of the nice things with the, with the Taranaki example, getting that community engagement with those those policy action plans and those sectors of interest was absolutely fundamental. And I guess that's perhaps 
links to the second part of the question of what are the key elements of a just transition. I think one of the first ones is listening, you know, listening to communities who are affected. What, what are their concerns and worries? Um, being a bit honest, perhaps, that you don't have all the answers. Like, you know, as a government to go in to somewhere like Taranaki, which has just had a, a big part of its economy, um, well, a big part of its future development unplugged, to say to them, okay, you guys deal with it. I mean, that's not really a realistic approach. You've got to, you've got to be able to say, look, what are your concerns? As a government, we're hearing those. Let's work together on some of those solutions. And, and I mean, it's not perfect and it's hard. And it takes time, as we said, but I mean, it, you're not going to achieve a just transition if you don't do that, if you don't listen to the affected communities, work with them to identify opportunities. Um, you, you're just not going to get anywhere. I mean, we've, it's very timely, this conversation, because we've just had overnight back home an announcement that um, a massive uh, aluminium smelter is going to close down. Um, and it's very regionally focused. It's way down the bottom end of New Zealand. Um, I won't tell you what the Rolling Stones said about the community that this aluminium smelter is um, in. It's not for polite company, but it's a, it's a long way from just about anywhere. But this aluminium smelter is, is the key driving force of that economy. And it's going to close. Um, so what do we do? I mean, there's a thousand jobs on the line. Um, great thing is it creates opportunities because that... Um, and again, you know, forgive me, people of Southland for saying this. It's really easy for someone in central government to say this. But, you know, that aluminium smelter was powered by hydroelectricity. It was our biggest single user of electricity in the whole country. And basically, we built an 850 megawatt power station to fuel that um, aluminium smelter. All of a sudden, there's 850 megawatts of renewable energy available for something else. What do we do with it? It's green hydrogen the way forward. And maybe this picks up on some of the things that, that Mike was saying, you know, how do we address those regions is what skills do they have that they can repurpose for other things? And, you know, we don't have an answer to this in terms of this aluminium smelter just yet, but maybe, and they've got port infrastructure, they've got heavy industry experience. Could they be doing creation of renewable hydrogen? I don't know. It's just a, just a couple of answers, but I think the key elements are you've got to have a genuine dialogue. Otherwise it just doesn't work. Sorry, Lucy, over to you. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, that's a really good example. And I think uh, the Taranaki example is also quite fascinating. This is, this is obviously the kind of importance of re bespoke, regional, local-led planning is a key theme that's come through in our Just Transition Commission's work so far. Um, the commission purposefully meets um, in different, well, met, uh, now it meets online, but previously it met in different places for every single one of its evidence sessions. Uh, unfortunately, one of the sessions that had to be canceled was the one where we were due to go out to Orkney, one of the most remote islands um, of the UK. So Scotland obviously has a huge island, um, remote island community um, and population, which, you know, any just transition has to be bespoke to those areas and the challenges that they face, not just around climate change, mitigation and adaptation, but aging populations, connectivity, uh, you know, wi much wider challenges. And um, so, I mean, for, for Scotland, it, you know, thing, areas that we're obviously looking at are where there are, you know, really key industries or sectors that have massive impact in in regions so obvious one for us is the oil and gas sector in the northeast of scotland and and but also you know there's there's a major refinery in in scotland grangemouth which is a huge employer for the area around it um you know and there there are there's a need to do that direct engagement to really understand the issues and the challenges in that space. And exactly as Roger was saying, is just start by engaging, start by listening, start by understanding, start by understanding which groupings and networks are already speaking to each other about this and then understanding where central government's role is in either in facilitating, convening, understanding which different levers are going to need to be de developed when so at what point do we introduce regulation at, at national level um but working back from that what are all of the different things that need to have been set up as sebastian was saying in order for people to be able to 
respond to those regulations so that they don't fall unfairly on people and that those levers are not just held at central government they're held at local government at businesses at sectoral level at community levels and at individual levels so how do we bring those groups together and understand the sequencing of those levers i think is 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 really challenging exactly as roger was saying it's a skill set in itself to be able to to go and, and, and hold those conversations. And certainly for us, we're hoping that the advice from our Just Transition Commission is going to help us to find some practical ways in which we can we can drive that forward. Um, Scotland has some frameworks in place already, city and town deals, which we're hoping can be used to support Just Transition, um, regional, regional deals, engagement with the UK government, obviously, is obviously critical for, for Scotland as well, as Mike will know. Um, so I think it's a really important issue. I think it's absolutely critical and we're very keen to learn as well from, from New Zealand's example and other areas that have looked at more of a, a regional based uh, approach. I know Germany has also had a Just Transition Commission that looked very specifically at regions. So how we learn, how we learn from that. And I think on the point about how do we define just, I think it's such a good question because I think this comes up all the time. What do you mean by just transition? What is that? What does that mean? And I think really it starts, and it's Mike's point as well, it's about putting people at the heart of our decision making when we think about the transition to net zero. It's about how we find a way of this not just being about economic growth, not just being about cutting emissions, both are absolutely critical, but it's about how we put well-being as the driver, the, 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 the North Star, we often call it in, in Scottish government, of how we're going to make decisions so that people are at the heart of that decision making. So that when we consider how we're going to cut emissions, we think first about people and their role in this and, and what the impacts will be on those people, how we require their participation. The CC the Committee on Climate Change's advice is unequivocal about this, that behaviour change is going to have to deliver the vast majority of our emission reductions. You know, we, we can't just get there through regulations or spending money. This is about a holistic approach and we can only do that if we centre this around people-based policymaking. Thank you very much. Um, I think it was also very interesting to hear beforehand uh, in addition to this fossil extraction examples that you've both taken, um, the reference to maybe lesser known uh, sectors in that sphere, you know, for instance, the impact on finance that Mike mentioned, or agriculture um, in France that Sebastian mentioned. Um, maybe if I may, just a, a quick point of where I see this kind of putting people at the center coming in tension is in the context of the COVID recovery, um, there's a lot of call to not just invest in sectors that are fit for the future, but also support in the very short term and in a very massive manner, those carbon intensive sectors with, where you know, workers might be laid off um, significantly unless the this government steps in. Um, so how do you manage this balancing act of you know, staying true to your, your North Star of reaching carbon neutrality? And, and in terms of sequence, you know, how do you um, decide as a policymaker how how do I reconcile those things? I mean, I, I can go first as I think I'm still unmuted. I mean, this is the the challenge, right? We talk a lot about um, green strings on business support or conditionality of our business support. Um, this is a very live discussion, Scottish Government. I'd be interested to hear Mike's views as well, more from across the UK space and, and Rogers indeed from, from New Zealand. France has already set some of the most uh, eye-catching conditions I know and, and Air France and uh, and the rail companies so I mean for us it's it's exactly that it's a recognition that there are some short-term challenges is it just to let whole industries go bankrupt is it fair on the people that are employed by those sectors not to try and support them to transition in the longer term to sustainable good jobs uh, you know that is that is the challenge. Uh, I mentioned earlier the £62 million pounds that Scotland has made available for an energy transition fund. It, that's going to the oil and gas industry in many respects, but it's going specifically to projects for the future. It's going to how are we going to deliver a hydrogen economy in Aberdeen and that northeast region as a future alternative growth model for the region. It's going to enterprise and, in, and innovation hubs for the region that are, are designed to help the region transition rather than in kind of no conditions bailouts for 
uh, the oil and gas sector as it as it is now. But it's a it's a huge challenge. I, I don't have a I don't have a good answer for you. I'm afraid it's something that's a very live discussion for us right now. Um, Sebastian and then Mike. Thank you very much. I think on this issue, um, we've been also looking, uh, I mean, with Lola, so I, I, I might speak for Lola, which is strange, but we, uh, we've been looking at the conditionalities and how what that really means, because we've been worried a lot about the fact that uh, there have been a lot of state of, of state aid for to preserve uh, jobs uh, in, the, in the recent history of uh, French policies. And, and it was very difficult to hold companies accountable for ensuring that because they have received state aid, then they, they need to preserve jobs in France because they can really rightly uh, claim that it was not their own responsibility uh, because there is the whole competition issue, et cetera, and the economic conjuncture, et cetera. So uh, what we hear is actually that, um, of course, you can't ask uh, one uh, fossil fuel company to go green from now to tomorrow. But a lot of the question is how can you ask commitments on a pathway towards zero, uh, net zero with specific milestones that are not too far away? And then how are you going to have enough contractual uh, counter counterparts and also political pressure in a kind of a pr pr process where this would make the current situation quite different from the moment uh, early 2010 when actually the, 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 the state aid for, for, for jobs was actually not <clears throat> answered by the capacity of those companies to really maintain the jobs that they had initially promised. And so I think we are we are on the moment where it's very important to have uh, uh, the capacity to in include unions, uh, NGOs, the whole civil society in a kind of a monitoring process of the recovery plans. And I think we have now a recovery, recovery process, uh, a recovery plan monitoring committee that is mostly uh, that, that is a good basis on which we want to, to invest a lot. But there is a whole lot also to be invested in the uh, governance of, of companies themselves. So ensuring that there are processes within the companies that ensure that there is social and, 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 and environmental responsibility to the extent that there is some accountability on the, on the state aid that has been received. Um, I just want to pinpoint that on the question about uh, how do you advise regions, we, we there are lots of uh, very similar uh, uh, answers to what you, you've been saying, Lucy, Roger, Mike, uh, in our reports on coaltransitions.org, uh, where we really see that it's about anticipating and engaging. I think these were the two words that you were saying, uh, Lucy. But, but one point that I want to pinpoint is particularly to say that uh, when we, we look at those regions, really, let's look also at the fact that because of automation, because of competition, those regions definitely will have jobs issues even without the transition to net zero. And that we could use the transition to net zero as something to get a new project for those regions and countries that anyway will face a lot of economic viability issues. Go, Mike. Sorry, I'm, that's not me, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I, we've been going for over 10 years now in the, in the Climate Committee. And when we first started, there was a real strong pushback really from, from heavy industry because it was seen as, a, as an existential threat that if you, if you had strong emissions targets, then you, you couldn't have heavy industry. That was the kind of the, the assumption. And it's been amazing actually to see where we've come after, after a decade because now we we have a lot of the heavy industry actually encouraging strong targets and embracing them because the conversation has moved on to just transition, because the conversation moved on to how do you decarbonize the industry rather than just reduce emissions. So I think that, that is a really good illustration of how important getting this issue right is actually. And by having a, a stronger collective that is behind the, the emissions target, you have a stronger politic behind trying to reach it and you have stronger policies and you, you achieve more so you know the just transition is not, again it's not just about doing things fairly it helps you to get to, to where you're trying to get to um and i think the message now is not you know it, it's to, to the fossil fuel companies to a lot of the heavy industry it's it's that we need you we just need you to do things differently <laughs> um and it, it, it is a transition that's that is the key word as well as just that we're trying to see people shift over. We're not not every car company is a Tesla today, but in 20 years' time, they will have to be. Every car company will have to be producing just electric cars, right? Not every energy company is an Orsted doing offshore wind, but Orsted used to be Danish oil and natural gas, right? So 
these tra different companies are at different stages on this. Actually, the ones that are further ahead are, are often the ones that are now doing better. And, and that extends right through into finance, actually. An amazing thing in this, this period has been that the clean bonds, the clean um, green, green finance tools have actually performed better through this period of shocks than brown bonds, right? And we are, we are increasingly seeing that as, uh, as, as what's happening overall. So I think the, the heavy industry conversation is, it, it maybe feels worse than it is when you get into it in practice. If you actually break it down and you engage and you have the conversations and you get to the detail of what has to happen, there is often a positive story to be found. Um, and there's a positive pathway and it's, it's engaging for the people that work in those firms, it's engaging for the, the people working in their boards, um, it's engaging for their shareholders and their customers and, um, and I think increasingly that, you know, that is where we're heading and, and we need to just get there faster. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. So just transition is also a way to be more effective uh, towards climate action. Um, Roger. Over to you. Actually, Mike said um, quite a bit of what I was about to say. So um, you can just say ditto from me on, on a lot of that. But maybe can I just, um, as we're heading towards the end of the session, just give a little plug um, for the OECD. And I do that um, uh, mostly because a lot of the policy questions around how do we use the, you know, the COVID response and what happens next out of that, um, the OECD is doing some really good work on that. I and mean, a lot of their policy thinking is available on their, their COVID hub. If you basically go to the OECD.org um, website and right at the top, there's a banner link and it touches on all of these, these kinds of questions. It doesn't have all the answers to be fair, um, but it touches on a lot of them. And just as an example, we had um, just the other day, the launch of the OECD's employment outlook and talking you know, about transition as part of that, how do we support you know, industries that are no longer as viable as they were post COVID and, you know, take a, a real world example from New Zealand. I mean, tourism, I mean, no one's going to New Zealand now. Our borders are basically shut apart from, from returning home Kiwis. Well, you can go there, but you've got to stay in quarantine for two weeks and well, there's half your annual leave gone. Um, so how do, how do we support that transition to a, a more viable future? I mean, it's, it's really tricky. And, and these are some of the things that are exactly the same as a just transition to a low carbon future, you know, how do we support workers instead of jobs? How do we put people at the center of our policy thinking? So even if we're not um, achieving exactly the same outcomes, like we might have a low carbon transition COVID recovery, the process is kind of the same and we'll end up in a very similar endpoint, um, I think. Anyway, so yeah, OECD are all going to have a look. It's good stuff. Thank you very much for the, this very effective plug. Um, I'm, I'm afraid we're coming to, to the end of our, um, of our webinar uh, because it's 2 p.m. and I would love to continue this discussion because I think there's been so many fascinating insights and, and presentations and I think we could all speak for a lot longer, but I'm just worried that we're going to be cut off uh, abruptly at some point. Um, so I'm just going to take a, a minute to thank very warmly uh, our four panelists who, who've all given incredibly interesting insights. Uh, thank you, everyone, to as well to the attendees for the great questions. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to go through all of them. Um, and also, more specifically, thank you to uh, the Scottish government in, in France to uh, have put all the effort and the incredible logistics for putting this together. Thank you, everyone, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.